My name is John Patmore Lindsay. By profession, I am a medical man and a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons and a member of the Royal College of Physicians, London. I am also the author of numerous medical works, the best known, perhaps, being How to Keep in Good Health and Live Long. I was educated at one of the large public schools and took my degree at Oxford. I have generally been regarded as a hard-headed man and skeptical about all phenomena that were not capable of being explained by rational and known laws. Mysticism, occultism, spiritualism, and the like only serve to excite my ridicule, and I entertained anything but a flattering opinion of those people who profess belief in such things. I was pleased to think it argued a weakness of mind. I have referred to the few foregoing facts about myself because I wish to make it clear that I do not belong to that class of nervous and excitable people who fall a prey to their own fancies, conjure up shapes and scenes out of their imaginings, and then vow and declare that they have been confronted with stern realities. What I am about to relate is so marvelous, so weird and startling, that I am fain to begin my story in a half-apologetic way, and even now, as I dwell upon it all, I wonder why I, of all men, should have been subjected to the unnatural and unearthly influence. But so it is, and though in a sense I am only half convinced, I no longer scoff when somebody reminds me that there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in our philosophy. But to my story, and when it is told, the reader can judge for himself how powerful must have been the effect of what I witnessed— when it could induce a man of my mental fiber to commit to paper so astounding a narrative as the one I now pen. It is about twenty years ago that I took up a practice in the old-fashioned and picturesque little town of Brinton-on-Sea. At that time, there was no railway into Brinton, the nearest station being some seven or eight miles away. The result was the town still retained a delightful old-time air, while the people were as primitive and old-fashioned as their town. Nevertheless, Brinton was far ahead of its neighbors, and though in a purely agricultural district, was enterprising and businesslike, while its weekly Tuesday market brought an enormous influx of the population of the district for miles around, and very large sums of money changed hands. Being the chief town of the parish, and boasting of a very curious and ancient church, and a still more ancient market cross, to say nothing of several delightful old hostelries, and a small though excellent museum of local curiosities, consisting principally of Roman remains and fossils, for which the district was renowned, it attracted not only the antiquary and the gourmand, but artists, tourists, and lovers of the picturesque, as well as those in search of quietude and repose. The nearest village was High Lee, about three miles away. Between the two places was a wide sweep of magnificent rolling down, delightful at all times, but especially so in the summer. Many an ancient farmhouse was dotted about, with here and there a windmill. The down on the seaside terminated in a high headland, from which a splendid lighthouse sent forth its warning beams over the fierce North Sea. Second only in conspicuousness to this lighthouse was an old and half-ruined windmill, known all over the countryside as the Haunted Mill. When I first went to live in Brinton, this mill early attracted my attention, for it was one of the most picturesque old places of its kind I had ever seen, and as I had some artistic instincts, and could sketch with, as my too flattering friend said, no mean ability, the haunted mill appealed to me. It stood on rising ground, close to the high road that ran between Brinton and High Lee. I gathered that there had been some dispute about the ownership, and, as is usually the case, the suckers of the harpies of the law had fastened upon it, so to speak, and drained all its vitality away after the manner of lawyers generally. The old-fashioned legal luminaries of the country were a slow-going set, and for over a quarter of a century that disputed claim had remained unsettled, and during that long period the old mill had been gradually falling into ruin. The foundations had, from some cause, sunk, throwing the main building out of the perpendicular. Part of the roof had fallen in, and the fierce gales of a quarter of a century had battered the sails pretty well to matchwood. A long flight of wooden steps led up to the principal door, but these steps had rotted away in places, and the door itself had partly fallen inwards. Needless to say, this mill had become the home of bats and owls, 
and according to the yokels, of something more fearsome than either. It was a forlorn and mournful-looking place, anyway, even in the full blaze of sunshine, but seen in moonlight, its appearance was singularly weird, and well calculated to beget in the rustic mind a feeling of horror, and to produce a creepy and uncanny sensation in anyone susceptible to the influence of outre appearances. To me, it did not appeal in any of those aspects. I saw in it only subject matter for an exceedingly effective picture, and yet I am bound to confess that even when transferred to board or canvas, there was a certain grim suggestiveness of things uncanny, and I easily understood how the superstitious and unreasoning rustic mind was awed into a belief that this moldering old mill was haunted by something more creepy and harrowing than bats and owls. Anyway, I heard wonderful tales, at which I laughed, and when I learned that the country people generally gave the mill a wide berth at night, blamed them for their stupidity. But it was a fact that worthy, and in other respects intelligent farmers and market folk, coming or going between Britain and High Lee after dark, preferred the much longer and dangerous route by the sea cliffs, even in the wildest weather. I have dwelt thus long on the haunted mill, because it bulks largely in my story, as will presently be seen, and I came in time to regard it with scarcely less awe than the rustics did. It was during the second year of my residence in Britain that a young man named Charles Royce came home, after having been absent at sea for three years. Royce's people occupied Gorse Hill Farm, about two miles to the south of Britain, Young Charlie, a fine, handsome, but rather wild youngster, had, it appears, fallen desperately in love with Hannah Trousel, who was a domestic in the employ of the rector of the parish. But Charlie's people did not approve of his choice, and thinking to cure him, packed him off to sea, and after an absence of three years and a month, the young fellow, bronzed, hearty, more rollicking and handsome than ever, returned to his native village. I had known nothing of Charles Royce or his history up to the day of his return, but it chanced on that very day I had to pay a professional visit to the rectory, and the rector pressed me to lunch with him. Greatly interested in all his parishioners, and knowing something of the private history of most of the families in his district, the reverend gentleman very naturally fell to talking about young Royce, and he told me the story, adding, Hannah is a good girl, and I think it's rather a pity Charlie's people objected to his courting her. I believe she would have made him a capital wife. Has she given him up entirely? I asked. Oh, yes, and is engaged to Silas Hartrop, whose father owns the fishing smack, the North Sea Beauty. I've never had a very high opinion of Silas. I'm afraid he is a little too fond of skittles and beer. However, Hannah seems determined to have him in spite of anything I can say so she must take her course. But I hope she will be able to reform him, and that the marriage will be a happy one. I really shouldn't be a bit surprised, however, if the girl took up with her old lover again, for I have reason to know she was much attached to him, and I fancy Charlie, if he were so minded, could easily influence her to throw Silas overboard. This little story of love and disappointment naturally interested me, for in a country town, the affairs of one's neighbors are matters of greater moment than is the case in a big city. So it came to pass that a few weeks after Charlie's return, it was pretty generally known that even as the rector had suggested it might be, young Royce and pretty Hannah Trousel were spooning again, and Silas had virtually been told to go about his business. It was further known that Silas had taken his dismissal so much to heart that he had been seeking consolation in the beer pot. Of course, folk talked a good deal, and most of them sympathized with Silas and blamed Hannah. Very soon it began to be brooded about that Royce's people no longer opposed any objections to the wooing, and that in consequence Hannah and Charlie were to become husband and wife at Christmas. That was in about seven weeks' time. A month of the time had passed, and the askings were up in the parish church, when one day there went forth a rumor that Charles Royce was missing. Rumor took a more definite shape a few hours later, when it was positively stated that two nights previously, Charles had left his father's house in high spirits and the best of health to visit Hannah and walk with her as she was going into the town to make some purchases. On his way, he called at the two wagoners, a wayside inn, where he had a pint of beer and purchased an ounce of tobacco. 
From the time he left the inn, all trace of him was lost, and he was seen no more. Hannah waited his coming until long past the appointed hour, and when he failed to put in an appearance, she became angry and went off to the town by herself. Next day, her anger gave place to anxiety when she learned that he had left his home to visit her and had not since returned, and anxiety became alarm when two and three days slipped by without bringing any tidings of the truant. On the night that he left his home, the weather was very tempestuous, and it had been wild and stormy since. It was therefore suggested that on leaving the two wagoners, he might have got confused when he reached the common, which he had to cross to get to the rectory, and as there were several pools and treacherous hollows on the common, it was thought he had come to grief, but the most diligent search failed to justify the surmise. Such an event as this was well calculated to cause a sensation, not only in Brinton and its neighborhood, but throughout the county. Indeed, for many days it was a common topic of conversation, and at the Brinton Weekly Market the farmers and the rustics dwelt upon it to the exclusion of other things, And of course, everybody, or nearly everybody, had some wonderful theory of his or her own to account for the missing man's disappearance. One old lady, who every week for twenty years had trudged in from a village five miles off with poultry and eggs for the Brinton market, declared her belief that young Royce had been spirited away, and she recommended an appeal to a wondrous wise woman, locally known as Cracked Mall but whose reputation for solving mysteries and discovering lost persons and things was very great. Ultimately, Royce's people did call in the services of this ancient fraud, but without any result. And despite the wide publicity and every effort on the part of the rural and county police, to say nothing of a 101 amateur detectives, the mystery remained unsolved. Charles Royce had apparently disappeared from off the face of the earth, leaving not a trace behind. In the process of time, the nine days' wonder gave place to something else, and excepting by those directly interested in him, Charles Royce was forgotten. Hannah took the matter very seriously to heart, and for a while lay dangerously ill. Silas Hartrop, who was much affected by his disappointment with regard to Hannah, went to the dogs, as the saying is, and drank so heavily that it ended in an attack of delirium tremens. I was called in to attend him, and had hard work to pull him through. On his recovery, his father sent him to an uncle at Yarmouth, who was in the fishing trade, and soon afterwards news came that young Hartrop had been drowned at sea. He was out in the North Sea in his uncle's fishing smack, and though nobody saw him go, it was supposed that he fell overboard in the night. This set the local tongues wagging again for a time, but even the affairs of Brinton could not stand still, because the ne'er-do-well Silas Hartrop was drowned. So sympathy was expressed with his people, and then the affair was dismissed. About two years later, I received an urgent message late one afternoon to hasten with all speed to High Lee, to attend to the squire there, who had been taken suddenly, and, as report said, seriously ill. I had had rather a heavy day of it, as there had been a good deal of sickness about for some time past, and it had taken me several hours to get through my list of patients. I had just refreshed myself with a cup of tea, and was about to enjoy a cigar when the messenger came. Telling him to ride back as quickly as possible and say that I was coming, I busied myself with a few important matters which had to be attended to, as I might be absent for some hours, and then I ordered my favorite mare, Princess, to be saddled. I set off from Brinton soon after seven. It was a November night, bitterly cold, dark as Erebus, while every now and then violent squalls swept the land from seaward. Princess knew the road well, so I gave the mare her head, and she went splendidly until we reached the ruined mill, when suddenly she wheeled round with such abruptness that though I was a good horseman, I was nearly pitched from the saddle. At the same moment, I was struck in the face by something that seemed cold and clammy. I thought at first it was a bat, but remembered that bats do not fly in November. An owl, but an owl would not have felt cold and clammy. However, I had little time for thought, as my attention had to be given to the mare. She seemed disposed to bolt and was trembling with fear. Then, to my intense astonishment, I noticed what seemed to be a large, luminous body lying on the roadway. It had the appearance of a corpse, illuminated in some wonderful and mysterious manner. 
Had it not been for the fright of my mare, I should have thought I was the victim of some optical delusion, but Princess evidently saw the weird object and refused to pass it. So impressed was I with the idea that a real and substantial body was lying on the road, notwithstanding the strange, unearthly light, that I slipped from the saddle, intending to investigate the matter, when suddenly it disappeared, and the cold and clammy something again struck me in the face. I confess that for the first time in my life I felt a strange, nervous, unaccountable fear. I say unaccountable because it would have been difficult for me to have given any explanation of my fear. Why and of what was I afraid? Now, whatever the phenomenon was, there was the hard, stern fact to face that my horse had seen what I had seen and was terrified. There was something strangely uncanny about the whole business, and when a terrific squall, bringing with it sleet and rain, came howling from the sea, it seemed to emphasize the uncanniness, and the ruined mill, looming gaunt and grim in the darkness, caused me to shake with an involuntary shudder. The next moment I was trying to laugh myself out of my nervousness. Princess and I, I mentally argued, had been the victims of some atmospheric delusion. That was all very well, but the something cold and clammy that struck me in the face, and which may have struck the mare in the face also, was no atmospheric delusion. With an alacrity I did not often display, I sprang into the saddle, spoke some encouraging words to the mare, for she was still trembling, and when she bounded forward and the haunted mill was behind me, I experienced a positive sense of relief. I found my patient at High Lee in a very bad way. He was suffering from an attack of apoplexy, and though I used all my skill on his behalf, he passed away towards midnight. His wife very kindly offered me a bed for the night, but as I had important matters to attend to early in the morning, I declined the hospitality though I was thankful for a glass or two of generous port wine and some sandwiches. It was half past twelve when I left the house on my return journey. The incident by the haunted mill had been put out of my head by the case I had been called upon to attend, but as I mounted my mare, the groom, who had brought her round from the stable, said, It be a bad night, doctor, for riding, the kind of night when dead things come out of their graves. I laughed and replied, Tom, lad, I'm surprised to hear you talk such rubbish. I thought you had more sense than that. Well, I tell you what, doctor, if I had to ride to Brinton tonight, I'd go by the cliffs and chance being drowned, rather than pass yon old mill. These words for the moment unnerved me, and I honestly confess that I resolved to go by the cliffs, dangerous as the road was in the dark. Nevertheless, I laughed at Tom's fears and ridiculed him, though when I left the squire's grounds, I turned the mare's head towards the cliffs. In a few minutes, I was ridiculing myself. John Patmore Lindsay, I mentally exclaimed, you are a fool. All your life, you've been ridiculing stories of the supernatural. And now, at your time of life, are you going to allow yourself to be frightened by a bogey? Shame on you. I bucked up, grew bold, and thereupon altered my course, and got into the high road again. There had been a slight improvement in the weather. It had ceased to rain, but the wind had settled down into a steady gale, and screeched and screamed over the moorland with a demoniacal fury. The darkness, however, was not so intense as it was, and a star here and there was visible through the torn clouds. But it was an eerie sort of night, and I was strangely impressed with a sense of my loneliness. It was absolutely unusual for me to feel like this, and I suggested to myself that my nerves were a little unstrung by overwork and the anxiety the squire's illness had caused me. And so I rode on, bowing my head to the storm, while the mare stepped out well, and I anticipated that in little more than half an hour I should be snug in bed. As we got abreast of the haunted mill, the mare once more jibbed and all but threw me, and again I was struck in the face by the cold, clammy something. I have generally prided myself on being a bold man, but my boldness had evaporated now, and I almost think my hair rose on end as I observed that the illuminated corpse was lying in the roadway again, but now it appeared to be surrounded by a lake of blood. It was the most horrible, weird, marrow-curdling sight that ever human eyes looked upon. I tried to urge Princess forward, but she was stricken with terror, and wheeling right round was setting off towards High Lee again. 
but once more I was struck in the face by the invisible something, and its coldness and clamminess made me shudder, while there in front of us lay the corpse in the pool of blood. The mare reared and plunged, but I got her head round, determining to make a wild gallop for Brinton and leave the horrors of the haunted mill behind. But the corpse was again in front of us, and I shrank back almost appalled as the something once more touched my face. I cannot hope to describe what my feelings were at this supreme moment. I don't believe anything human could have daunted me, but I was confronted by a supernatural mystery that not only terrified me, but the mare I was riding. Whichever way I turned, that awful, ghastly object confronted me, and the blow in the face was repeated again and again. How long I endured the unutterable horrors of the situation, I really don't know. Possibly the time was measured by brief minutes. It seemed to me hours. At last my presence of mind returned. I dismounted and reasoned with myself that whatever the apparition was, it had some import. I soothed the mare by patting her neck and talking to her, and I determined then to try and find a solution of the mystery. But now a more wonderful thing happened. The corpse, which was still made visible by the unearthly light, rose straight up, and as it did so the blood seemed to flow away from it in great gurgling streams, for I solemnly declare that I distinctly heard gurgling sounds. The figure glided past me, and a sense of extraordinary coldness made me shiver. Slowly and gracefully, the shining corpse glided up the rotting steps of the old mill and disappeared through the doorway. No sooner had it gone than the mill itself seemed to glow with phosphorescent light and to become transparent, and I beheld a sight that took my breath away. I am disposed to think that for some moments my brain became so numbed that insensibility ensued, for I am conscious of a blank. When the power of thought returned, I was still holding the bridle of the mare, and she was cropping the grass at her feet. The mill loomed blackly against the night sky. It had resumed its normal appearance again. The wind shrieked about it. The ragged scud raced through the heavens, and the air was filled with the sounds of the raging wind. At first I was inclined to doubt the evidence of my own senses. I tried to reason myself into a belief that my imagination had played me a trick, but I didn't succeed, although the mystery was too profound for my fathoming. So I mounted the mare, urged her to her fastest pace, galloped into Brinton, and entered my house with a feeling of intense relief. Thoroughly exhausted by the prolonged physical and mental strain I had endured, I speedily sank into a deep though troubled slumber as soon as I got into bed. I was unusually late in rising the next day. I found that I had no appetite for breakfast. Indeed, I felt ill and out of sorts, and though I busied myself with my professional duties, I was haunted by the strange incidents of the preceding night. Never before in the whole course of my career had I been so impressed, so unnerved, and so dispirited. I wanted to believe that I was still as skeptical as ever, but it was no use. What I had seen might have been unearthly, but I had seen it, and it was no use trying to argue myself out of that fact. The result was, in the course of the afternoon, I called on my old friend, Mr. Goodyear, who was chief of the county constabulary. He was a strong-minded man, and like myself, a hardened skeptic about all things that smacked of the supernatural. Goodyear, I said, I'm out of sorts, and I want you to humor a strange fancy I have. Bring one of your best men, and come with me to the haunted mill. But first, let me exact from you a pledge of honor— that if our journey should result in nothing, you will keep the matter secret, as I am very sensitive to ridicule. He looked at me in amazement, and then, as he burst into a hearty laugh, exclaimed, I say, my friend, you are overworking yourself. It's time you got a locum tenens and took a holiday. I told him that I agreed with him. Nevertheless, I begged him to humor me and accompany me to the mill. At last, he reluctantly consented to do so, and an hour later we drove out of the town in my dog cart. There were four of us, as I took Peter, my groom, with me. We had provided ourselves with lanterns, but Goodyear's man and Peter knew nothing of the object of our journey. When we got abreast of the mill I drew up, and giving the reins to Peter I alighted, and Goodyear did the same. Taking him on one side, I said, 
I have had a vision, and unless I am the victim of incipient madness, we shall find a dead body in the mill. The light of the dog cart was shining full on his face, and I saw the expression of alarm that my words brought. Look here, old chap, he said in a cheery, kindly way as he put his arm through mine. You are not going into that mill, but straight home again. Come now, get into the cart, and don't let's have any more of this nonsense. I felt disposed to yield to him, and had actually placed my foot on the step to mount, when I staggered back and exclaimed, My God, am I going mad, or is this a reality? Once again I had been struck in the face by the cold clammy something, and I saw Goodyear suddenly clap his hand to his face as he cried out, Hello, what the deuce is that? Aha! I exclaimed exultantly, for I no longer thought my brain was giving way. You have felt it too? Well, something cold and nasty-like struck me in the face. A bat, I expect. Confound him. Bats don't fly at this time of the year, I replied. By Jove, no more they do. I approached him and said in a low tone, Good year, this is a mystery beyond our solving. I'm resolved to go into that mill. He was a brave man, though for a moment or two he hesitated. But on my insisting, he consented to humor me, and so we lit the lantern and leaving the groom in charge of the horse and trap, I, Goodyear, and his man made our way with difficulty up the rotting steps, which were slimy and sodden with wet. As we entered the mill, an extraordinary scene of desolation and ruin met our gaze as we flashed the light of the lantern about. In places, the floor had broken away, leaving yawning chasms of blackness. From the moldering rafters, huge festoons of cobwebs hung, the accumulated dust and dampness of years had given them the appearance of cords. And oh, how the wind moaned eerily through the rifts and crannies and broken windows. If ever there was a place on this earth where evil spirits might dwell, it was surely that ghoul-haunted old mill. The startling aspect of the place impressed us all, perhaps me more than the other two. We advanced gingerly, for the floor was so rotten we were afraid it would crumble beneath our feet. My companions were a little bewildered, I think, and were evidently at a loss to know what we had come there for. But some strange feeling impelled me to seek for something, though if I had been asked to define that something, for the life of me I could not have done it. Forward I went, however, taking the lead, and holding the lantern above my head so that its rays might fall afar. But they revealed nothing save the rotting floor and slimy walls. A ladder led to the upper story, and I expressed my intention of mounting it. Goodyear tried to dissuade me, but I was resolute, and led the way. The ladder was so creaky and fragile that it was not safe for more than one to be on it at a time. When I reached the second floor and drew myself up through the trap, I am absolutely certain I heard a sigh. You may say it was the wind. I swear it was not. The wind was moaning drearily enough, but the sigh was a distinctive note, and unmistakable. As I turned the lantern round so that its light might sweep every hole and corner of the place, I noticed what seemed to be a sack full of something lying in a corner. I approached and touched it with my foot, and drew back in alarm, for touch and sound told me it contained neither corn nor chaff. I waited until my companions had joined me. Then I said to Goodyear, Unless I am mistaken, there is something dreadful in that sack. He stooped and placed his hand on the sack, and I saw him start back. In another moment he recovered himself, and whipping out his knife cut the string which fastened up the mouth of the sack, and revealed a human skull, with the hair and shriveled mummified flesh still adhering to it. Great heavens, he exclaimed, here is a human body. We held a hurried conversation, and decided to leave the ghastly thing undisturbed until the morrow. So we scuttled down as fast as we could, and went home. I did not return to the mill again myself. My part had been played. Investigation made it absolutely certain that the moldering remains were those of poor Charlie Royce, and it was no less absolutely certain that he had been foully murdered. For not only was there a bullet hole in the skull, and a bullet inside, but his throat had been cut. It was murder, horrible and damnable. The verdict of the coroner's jury pronounced it murder, but there was no evidence to prove who had done the deed. Circumstances, however, pointed to Charlie's rival, Silas Hartrop. 
Was it a guilty conscience that drove him to drink? And did the Furies who avenge such deeds impel him on that dark and stormy night in the North Sea to end the torture of his accursed earthly life? Who can tell? The sea holds its secrets, and not a scrap of legal evidence could be obtained. But though the law declined the responsibility of fixing the guilt of the dark deed on Silas, there was a consensus of opinion that he was the guilty party. It was a mystery, but the greatest mystery of all was that I, the skeptic, should have been selected by some supernatural power to be the instrument for bringing the foul crime to light. For myself, I attempt no explanation. I have told a true story. Let those who can explain it. I admit now that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy.